All right, let's go ahead and get started. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Markups and Markdowns, the Strategy of Effective Pricing. My name is Casey and I'll be the moderator for today's event. We have an exciting webinar ahead and before we get started there are a few things I'd like to cover. First, that the webinar today will be recorded and made available to everyone after the event is over. Of course, feel free to share it. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to use the chat and question box at the right of your screen in the GoToWebinar control panel. Because of time constraints, we'll be answering all questions via email following the webinar. Finally, we will be live tweeting throughout the webinar today, so please feel free to join in the conversation on Twitter and tag us at Rick's Software. I believe that covers all of the housekeeping details, so let's dive in. As I mentioned, my name is Casey McManamy. I joined the amazing team here at Rick's Software as the Customer Marketing Manager just over a month ago. My role here is focused on building customer value and advocacy as well. For those RICS customers that have joined us today, I hope to connect with you and your team in the very near future to learn more about your business and how you're using RICS. For those out there that don't currently use RICS software, here's a little bit more about what we do. So RICS makes retail technology primarily used by North American foot footwear and apparel retailers. Our clients use the RICS product to manage their inventory, sell at the point of sale, track customer data, and report on business performance. We've been around for 35 years, which is a long time for a tech company. At RICS, we're constantly working to evolve and the way um, we're growing, profiting, uh, in order to be sustainable. First and foremost, we do this by by focusing on our clients and their needs, and then by focusing on gaining and empowering new retailers with our software. We've got a great team here at RICS with a variety of backgrounds and experience in retail, technology, and change management. Um, in fact, unlike some other providers you might be familiar with, here at RICS we make, test, sell, support, and consult on our own product. That means that we built the cloud-based subscription retail technology that you know in-house and took it directly to market. So we're very proud about that here at Rex. And without any further ado, I will hand the mic over to Paul Erickson, Vice President of Client Services at RMSA. Paul, thank you again for joining us. It's been such a pleasure working with you over these last few webinars. I know you've got a lot of great information jam-packed into this presentation to share, so please take it away. Thanks, Casey, and welcome, everybody. Um, uh, we're very, very excited about this particular webinar. I think of all the webinars and seminars that I do around North America, uh, the one that gets the most comments and people love the best is pricing. Uh, but before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about RMSA. It says 60 years. You know, I've, one of the things I've started on the prior webinars with our, with our good friends at Rick's is that I tell Casey, I'll see your 35 years and raise you 60. Um, what that really means is that our co companies combined have almost 100 years of helping retailers be more profitable by better information. Uh, RMSA, as we've often said, we turn data into profit dollars and we make retail more of a science and less of a guessing game. And anyone that would be interested in finding out more about how we help retailers uh, can contact us at info at rmsa.com or my email address is perickson at rmsa.com. The psychology of price, the mark up and mark down game. Um, Leonardo da Vinci said, all our knowledge has its origin in our perceptions. And I think it seems like lately nothing in this world has concrete meaning anymore. And at the end of the day, price is merely a perception. Nothing more, nothing less. And what I hope to do over the next 30 or 40 minutes is to give everyone on this webinar a better understanding of how our customers perceive prices in that way to help you increase your initial markup on the merchandise that you're bringing into your stores and be able to take more effective discounts that can sell the merchandise but yet decrease your markdowns. So let's start out with the initial markup. That's finding the right price on merchandise. Um, I often ask uh, retailers if I could show you a way to increase your initial markup with 
absolutely no loss of business or uh, no problem with your image, um, would you do it? And of course, everybody says they would. The one thing about initial markup in retail and many of the verticals that RMSA and Rick serve is they really haven't changed that much over the last 25 years. While all our costs have gone up from rent to payroll, et cetera, initial markups have really kind of hovered uh, about the same from where they were in the 80s. So expenses are going up, competition is greater, but our margins, our, our initial margins have been essentially about the same. And when I started in retail, we had this thing called keystone pricing, which is essentially doubling the cost paid for merchandise. And that was back in the 70s, and I'm aging myself now, that was kind of the rule for pricing products. It was, it was referred to as keystone markup and no longer really being used as often as it once was in retail. But why did we just double the cost and how did that come from and why is it called keystone markup and when did it originate how long has this been going on you know certainly doubling the cost would be easy I'm sure the first actual retail store was back in caveman days it was the caveman spear shop and org to calculate his markup at the caveman spear shop would simply say spear cost org one rock org sell for two rocks but the term keystone markup has been around for so long there's practically no definitive answers on where it came from so I made a call years ago to the National Retail Federation and what they told me is there there used to be an actual markup key in the very early days of cash registers we're talking now the 19th century this practice predated individually ticketed items and pricing was oftentimes handled right at the point of sale because here's a little history lesson about retail prior to the end of the 19th century when Timothy Eaton in Canada pioneered a radical new concept called fixed pricing in which every item in the Eaton stores throughout Canada would have a price on it now there is a there's a big change and that price was not negotiable because prior to Tim Eaton doing that prior to the end of the 19th century retail essentially was transactions based on bartering so over the years, I've often asked retailers today to define how they come up with their initial markup, and their answers are always really quite interesting, I think. They run the gamut from doubling the cost and then I add a dollar, or I do a multiplier in everything I buy, so I take the cost times 2.2, .2, as an example. Or when asked why an item was ticketed at that specific price, they, some people get very defensive and they go, well, that's what I always price it at, and that item can be found on the internet, so I can't change the price, and it's a map price, and my competitor down the street carries it, and that's what they price it, but more on all that later. I think for generally, though, these answers would lead anyone to the conclusion that most independent retailers truly can't explain what initial markup was intended to cover. There are three elements, and these are very, very important, that we need to know so that we have a goal on the overall initial markup of new products coming into our store. The first is we need a markdown. We need a markdown percent to sales budget. What is the acceptable amount of markdowns that our st store takes as a percent to sales over the course of a year? Then what's our cost of doing business, our overhead, our operating expenses, everything but the merchandise itself, the rent, the payroll, advertising, et cetera, as a percent to sales. And last but not least is every journey needs a destination. How much money do we want to make? What is our goal in terms of net profit this year as a percent to sales? And when we have all of these three th things, we can then put them into a formula and that formula will tell us what we must get as an IMU initial markup target for our business. Now there is the actual formula. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, I believe that Rick will provide this presentation to you and it will be recorded. It is being recorded so you can refer back to it. So in the sake of brevity, let's throw my numbers in. These are very common numbers, by the way, in the verticals that RMSA and Rick serve. Markdowns, let's say we should, we can accept 20% retail markdowns to sales. 
Our operating costs, when it's all said and done, run about 40% to our sales. And we need to make, or our goal is that we want to make a 6% pre-tax net profit in our business. When we throw the numbers into that same formula, they come up with 55%. In other words, we must have an initial markup of 55% to cover the markdowns and to cover the expenses so that we can get to six. So what is 55% and what if we didn't even know that and say we were at 52.5% which you see on the left side of your screen. With the same markdowns it lowers our maintain from to 43%. Our expenses stay the same at 40 but our net looks at to be 3% or $30,000 on a million dollar business. But it should have been at 55. Now here's something very, very interesting. By simply increasing our initial markup from 52.5% to where we should be 55, two and a half points, we increase our net profit by three points. And what I'm saying is that every dollar, shekel, centavo, peso, and lira that you can increase your initial markup will go right to your bottom line. And that should motivate everybody on this call to look at things with a fresh set of eyes. What's the difference between 52.5% and 55% in this example? Well, 52.5% is $9 cost, $19 retail. 55% is $9 cost, in $20 retail. But that's not a good price. Because if we reduce the left digit by one, we're still at 55%. But instead of pricing it at $20, if we price it at $19.90 or $19.95 or some people gasp when I say $19.99, it's still the same markup but it changes the way our customer looks at the price. Our brain processes $20 versus $19.90 differently as different values. Our brain says $19.90 is $19, which is cheaper than $20. It's called charm pricing, and it has to be the left digit. It doesn't do you any good if you have a, something at $3.80 and you price it at $3.79. That means nothing. The left digit anchors the perceived magnitude of the price. And trust me when I tell you this, that the consumer rounds down, they do. There are so few black and white things in retail. Retail is a sea of gray when it comes to deciding what to do. This one's black and white. The customer always rounds down. $99.90 is not 100, it's 90 something. 49.90 is not 50, it's 40 something. And that has, that has been researched and done, looked at, for decades and it always comes out the same. But let's dig a little deeper in how we should position prices. Um, you know when you design layout it seems odd but directional cues are really associated with certain concepts. Let me give you an example. Numbers grow larger left to right. Think when you were a child and you learned numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Left to right. We conceptualize smaller prices as always belonging to the left of the higher price. Now that may seem odd that directional cues are associated with certain concepts, but if you think about spatial concepts, the spatial concept for up is metaphorically associated with good qualities while the spatial concept of down not so good qualities. Let me give you some example. The righteous go up to heaven, but sinners go down to hell. We rate good movies with a thumbs up, and if we didn't like that movie, that's a thumbs down. Marijuana will get you high, I've been told, but after the euphoria, you come down. Spatial concepts on how the consumer views things are important. Men process ads and signage less in depth and use price color 
to judge perceived save, savings. Red, the color red becomes the focal point of attention and thus a very important information to evaluate their purchases plus more men, more importantly men, associate red prices with savings. Research has been done with that and that happens to be true. If we remove the comma on higher priced items, it looks cheaper. Research has found that removing the commas and taking out uh, uh, commas and, and, and decimal points can make the price seem lower to the consumer. $14.99 seems less than $1,499.99. Round prices are processed more fluently, whereas non-rounded prices are processed disfluently. Could one choice generate more sales? Well, research has said that it does. Non-rounded prices need, to, need more mental resources to process, more fitting with rational purchases. Now, there's one big caveat on this. Even with emotion-based, avoid rounded pricing intervals like $100, $500, $1,000, because people assume those prices are artificially higher as though they were plucked from thin air. That's why $1,490 or $1,499 is better than $1,500. Now, there's competitive pricing, of course. Consumers have many choices and are generally willing to shop around to receive the best price. So let's just review some of the competitive pricing that seem to work for certain retailers. The first one, of course, is multiple pricing. It's a method which involves selling more than one product for one price. I think Joseph A. Bank is the classic example. Buy one suit, get 100 for free. I mean, this is an actual ad. Buy one, get seven. Can you imagine the initial markup they must have on that merchandise? Now, not only is this strategy great for markdowns and sales events, but consumers tend to purchase in larger amounts where multiple pricing strategy is used. J.C. Penney is known, but it's, you could go down a long list of retailers that use discount pricing, or what I uh, like to call it is high-low. Compare at 70, was 49, now 39.99. Consumers have really become addicted to high-low pricing, and that's why it continues to this day, even though a lot of these retailers have been subject to a bevy of lawsuits on inaccurate pricing, deceptive pricing. It's essentially saying a high price is listed to communicate the value of the goods and then a coupon or a discount is issued and that coupon or discount signals, hey, this is a good deal. Now, merchandise per priced at or below cost is sometimes referred to as a loss leader. Although retailers make no profit on these discounted items, the strategy is consumers will purchase other related items at higher margins during the visit to the store. The caveat of this is make sure you have enough of the lost leader. There's nothing someone is going to be more upset with you than offer, offering a $49.99 iPad and at 9 o'clock you open the store and at 9.30 you're sold out. Know your competition. Now, the most basic comp competitive pricing model is simply know how your competition is pricing the products. Examine your vendor channels of distribution in your area and what's online. Anything that I'm telling you to improve your initial markup does not have to do where we are locked in to a certain price based on readily available competitors pricing online or in another store. Know your merchandise, where it is in the competition, and of course, price accordingly. And last but not least, customers considering any kind of competitive pricing strategy shouldn't forget that they're still going to need to provide outstanding customer service to stand above the competition. Now, I think this is particularly important to stay, steer clear of cost-based pricing because I think cost-based pricing is the biggest reason why many independent retailers don't get more markup, initial markup on their merchandise. I believe that once we know the cost of something, that that becomes a sort of source of gravity that keeps our initial pricing lower than what it could be. So what am I really saying here? Well, to steer clear of cost-based pricing, 
Decide on the retail price before you know the cost. What happens is that you sit in a showroom, you sit in a booth at a trade show, you see an item that you know you can get more markup on because it's not readily available online or in your competitor store. And so you look at it and you look at you give it to your partner and then you say, I think we could sell this. This looks great. And the next thing you do is ask the salesperson, how much is it? And that's where you lose. Don't ask that. Once you ask the salesperson, how much is it, that now cost price becomes grounded into a source of gravity that will, will keep your initial markup or your pricing of that product lower than it should be. What you should say before you ask the cost price is determine the price on the retail price before you know the cost. I like this widget. What do you think we could sell it for? I think we could get thirty nine fifty for it. Great. I do too. Now you ask the price. If the salesman would have said nine dollars, you have to admit it that you probably would have said, "Boy, we can get away with more markup on this. Let's market twenty-seven or twenty-nine." It would have held you back. You somehow you would have thought that's too much markup. So determine the price when writing the order, but when you know the retail price, then make the decision to buy or not to buy. The gravity of cost can steer you to, uh, it will, will hold down your initial markup. I'll give you another example of that. Uh, um, several years ago, I was in Orlando, Florida, and I was giving a seminar to a group of various different types of retailers, and, at, and it was on pricing. And my sponsors took me to lunch, and on the way back to the uh, hotel where the event was held, um, I walked by a high-end men's store, a luxury men's store. And the owner literally saw me walking in front of the store, and he comes running out, and he said, Paul, I have to tell you, I've already instituted your pricing policy. I looked at my watch and I said, it's been 45 minutes. That was quick. And he goes, well, I got back to the store and you were talking about the cost price and where we can get more markup. And we had just received uh, a shipment of Robert Talbot ties. And those of you on the call that don't know, Robert Talbot's a beautiful tie line, high end, fits into a store like this. And my tie buyer was pricing the ties in the back room. And every tie had a $115 retail price tag on. I asked the buyer, Phil, Phil, how did you come up with the $115? And he said, well, this is what we always price them at, boss. You've never asked this before. And he said, but wait, let's think about this for a second. Who else, how do we sell ties in the store? Ties are essentially sold when someone buys a suit, a, a CEO of a company, someone making a lot of money is buying a $3,000 or $2,000 suit. They've put dress shirt tie combinations with the suit. He picks two or three out, has, them, has it tailored, delivered to his office the next week. Most of the time, they don't even look at the price. If they did, where else would they compare? They're not online. Nobody's going out and looking at going online to try to see if they can get a five dollars off a hundred and fifteen dollar tie. And the only other store in Orlando that sold the line was Nordstrom's across town. So why couldn't we get it one nineteen or maybe one nineteen fifty? Because really nobody notices the sense. And if you knew how many Robert Talbot ties they sold, that four dollars and fifty cents is a significant number. I'll share with you one other significant number of pricing on how small things can add up to big things. I fly in Delta Airlines a lot. About a year ago, I was checking, doing an audit of some of the tickets I've been buying, and I noticed that Delta Airlines had been charging me 20 cents for every individual round-trip ticket. So if it was $454 was the airfare, it was $454, and then in very light, tiny little cents, they had 20 cents. It didn't didn't even register to me. I didn't even notice it. It wasn't a big deal. I didn't care. Never would have, I never would have, you know, changed my ticketing. I wouldn't have went to United because of those 20 cents. And my suspicion would be that there's not one customer worldwide that would have. It meant nothing to the consumer, 20 cents. But what did it mean to Delta Airlines? I went and looked up the amount of tickets Delta sold last year. It was 180 million. 180 million times 20 cents is 36 million dollars that Delta Airlines just added to its bottom line invisibly by doing nothing and no one cared. Sometimes the little things in your store can add up to be big numbers. The end of the story is that about six months ago Delta Airlines is now pricing their tickets with 40 cents. Now we all hate to pay. We all love money and we hate to get rid of it. That's a human theme that we have. So how do we reduce the pain of paying? Now, some people call that 
the saliency effect. Now, I, I like to look at Lyft and Uber, and, and the reason why I think Lyft and Uber are, are different and why they revolutionized the taxi industry is that traditional taxi rides, the pain of payment is really high. You see the meter right in front of you increasing every minute, which evokes an increasingly painful sensation. Plus, at the end of the ride, you have to pay by either cash or credit card, but you have to pay. Uber, Lyft, they're different. There's no visual meter. There's no physical payments. There's much less pain. The dollar sign can remind people of pain. That's why when you go to some higher-end restaurants, they list prices on their menu or on their wine list without the currency symbols. I'll have the 2015 Sauvignon Blanc for 39 No dollars. The caveat of that is you only use this tactic in formats where customers are going to expect a price, like menus. Separate payment mediums. You know, by creating a separate medium between your customer's money and their payment, you distort the perception of paying. They know they're paying, but it doesn't really feel like it. That's what casino chips and gift cards have in common. Now, we're going to talk about markdowns. I know the word itself strikes fear into the hearts of most retailers, so, but we're going to deal with it anyway. This is Paul the Therapist talking to you right now. You can call it by whatever term you wish, price adjustment, promotion, we just ran a sale. The translation is the same, and it conjures up all sorts of negative emotions for retailers. But the fact remains, however, that any reduction in the retail price is a markdown. And that markdown is an expense. An expense every bit as real as the rent you pay monthly or the payroll checks that you give out. But this is an expense that you don't write a check for. It shows up by increasing your cost of goods sold. So we need to have a discussion of markdowns. And we'll talk a little bit about the good and the bad and maybe even the ugly on markdowns. But the good and the, the good markdowns keep our inventory fresh. If we react to slow selling merchandise, they assure a good cash flow, a good flow of inventory coming in and going out. And quite frankly, markdowns for most of RMSA and Rick's customers and users and clients are simply a cost of doing business. Nothing more, nothing less. But now the bad. Well, number one, the bad markdowns, those are, they can be higher than any other expense that a retailer has on their income statement. The highest expense we typically have is payroll. Total payroll for a retail store, to, independent retail store today can be as high as 20%. But yet we talk to mark that, we talk to retailers all the time where markdowns are far in excess of that. And the markdowns can be so high they raise the cost of goods sold and can result in a net loss. Now, what are those root causes then of those excessive markdowns, not the ones we can tolerate and plan and accept the good. What are the root causes of the bad? Well, there's lots of them. I just put three. Current rate of sale, the selling too slow, duplication, too large assortments, too many vendors. I could go down a very long list of what causes excessive markdowns and bloated inventory. But the number one cause is we buy too much overbuying, buying more merchandise than you can profitably sell within a reasonable period of time. Now, what is that period? Well, that depends on the merchandise type. It depends on your turn rate. But all inventory, with the possible exception of gold or a fine cabernet, depreciates over time and has a defined shelf life. If a category has a goal of four turns, then we should never buy more than we can realistically sell in three months. And markdown decisions take place within that defined time frame. Now, here's some things about markdowns that I think a lot of retailers need, need to appreciate. First of all, the lowest price doesn't always win the sale. Human beings are more likely to avoid a loss than seek a win. We hate losing. We really do. And for most human beings, money is good, and giving it up 
is bad. Hence, the way we frame a sale or price is very, very important. Save makes customers see how much they saved versus how much they spent. This is why many stores print a reminder on their receipts at the bottom by saying, you saved $45.50 by shopping with us today. Now, one of the things that you never see is Diet Coke at 20% off or Colgate toothpaste at 15% off or any packaged goods being sold at a percentage off. And you ever wonder why that is? Well, there's a good reason why the packaged good industry doesn't use percentage off incentives while the rest of us in the rest of the retail world have gone percentage crazy. Now, the first drawback to the psychology of percentages is that you ask the consumer to do a mathematical calculation and well, even in the best of times, the average consumer is, shall I say, somewhat math challenged. And the second drawback is that it's dangerous. The second drawback is that consumers develop immunity, or shall I say, an addiction to percentages. It takes a higher and higher percentage to get them to act. Your body building a tolerance to alcohol over time, the longer you drink, the more it takes you to get intoxicated. That's why today 20% off rarely works. In fact, for most consumers, it's deemed worthless unless it's applied to a product that's rarely discounted, like alcohol. A $25 coupon has more motivation than a 25% off coupon because it's easier to grasp. Consumers are more likely to respond to a known amount. And easy is what the consumer is looking for today. Make it simple for me is the new hook, especially if you sell higher or moderately priced items. Recently, an online study tested the effectiveness of various email offers. They chose $50 off a purchase as a reasonably good incentive that would still main sufficient margin. And using the exact same parameters, they then picked 15% off offer because it was equivalent, the same, to the same price. The $50 off coupon had a 92% higher conversion rate and generated 270% more revenue than the percentage off. It works. It works. Now, like anything in life, markdowns have rules. So I want to go through a few of them with you. First rule is we need to have a markdown budget. We need to plan. We need to have that markdown budget. If it's 20% to our sales, we need to know the dollar number. And if we do a million dollars in sales, then we know we can take $200,000 in markdowns. We need to know that we shouldn't be afraid that we use the budget and don't be under. I'd rather err on selling it too low but getting our money back too fast. We want to use price points and not percentages. And we need to learn. Every markdown should be a learning experience. It's an expense. Why didn't it sell? What can we do to learn from this mistake? How do we pay our tuition? The markdown should be considered as tuition on your education as a retailer. Learn from them. Don't make the mistake again, but pay your tuition. Now, there's some truths about markdowns as well. Number one is always explain to your customers why you're doing it. Because if we fail to explain to them that this was end of season or damaged or defective or overstocked or special purchase or even weekend only, and we just put sale on, on things, then we run the risk of them never believing any of our prices and turning each interaction with your customer into a mini auction. Well, Bill, I know this is on sale. You put that on sale, but when's that going on sale? Tell them why it's on sale. Markdown truth number two, overbuying, as I said before, is the number one cause of excessive markdowns. Learn how to buy with a good flow of inventory coming in and going out. Increase your turn, reduce your markdowns. Markdown truth number three, this is the oldest saying in the world. Anybody went to retail school, first thing they said that the first day of retail school is, you know, Paul, your first markdown is the cheapest. And I think for a lot of retailers, that means if we just if we react quickly to a problem, 
we don't have to mark it down as much. In other words, we can sell it at a higher price uh, in October than we would in January. That's not really what it means. Your first markdown is the cheapest markdown if you make it work. Because in retail, more important than margin is time, getting our money back quickly. Your first markdown will be the cheapest markdown if you price it that'll sell quickly. Imagine that you're not, you're not the owner of the store, but you're a buyer or a manager. And the owner has come in and said, you see this rack or this shelf or these items here? I want them gone in two weeks. I don't care how you do it. I want my money back. I want to admit the mistake and take an aggressive markdown. Markdowns should be shot and killed, not wounded. The saddest thing in retail is a wounded markdown. You've all been in stores where you've seen things priced 120, 99, 60, 79, 69, 49. You know, the customer is going, I'll just wait till it gets to nine. Take your markdown fast and you won't have an image of a sales store because it'll be gone before the other customers even know it was there. The first markdown is the cheapest markdown if it works. Now clearly I don't think this needs to be said, but I'm leaving this in there as markdown truth number four. The price you paid has nothing to do with the markdown price. If you made a turkey of a mistake and you priced it 120 and you paid 50, if your first markdown has to be 39.99 and that's what you know you'll get your money back, then do it. Because the cost has nothing, the customer doesn't know the cost. You just want to admit the mistake and get your money back and learn from every markdown and emphasize the amount of saving rather than the price itself and always position sale prices to the right of the original price and always keep your markdown items at the back of the store drag your customers through the front of the store to see all the new shiny things that just came in before they get to the markdown items at the back Guys, thank you very much for allowing me to share some of my ideas on pricing psychology. I said it would be 30 to 40 minutes, Casey, and it's been 37 minutes. So how about that for good timing? Paul, what an excellent webinar and a great way to end the series with RMSA. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to conclude today's webinar and that RMSA webinar series by thanking you, Paul, and of course the rest of the RMSA team for participating. As a reminder to everyone here listening, um, today was that third and final webinar of this three-part series, but you can find the content from the first two webinars at ricksoftware.com under the Resources tab. We have also recorded today's webinar, so you can expect to receive that recording in your inbox soon. And just one last reminder that we will be answering any questions you had today via email. So please feel free to take down both my information and Paul's and send any additional questions our way. Paul, thanks again so much for joining us. Anything you'd like to wrap up with? No, I just want to thank Casey and the whole team uh, at Rick's for being great partners and sponsoring these webinars. I hope everybody that's been on all three has really learned something that can improve their bottom line of their business. Awesome. Thank you so much. And everyone, I hope you all have a great day. Bye-bye, everybody.